send you an email for all the Dropbox accounts. It's the same. Hello, and thank you for joining us as part uh, for this session as part of Jewish Disability Advocacy Month. My name is Lee Smith, and I am a member of Temple Road of Shalom in Virginia, and I'm currently a student at Rochester Institute of Technology. I'm studying deaf studies and public policy. In today's session, Effective Advocacy for Inclusive Policy, we are pleased to be able to provide both live captioning and American Sign Language interpretation, thanks to a generous grant from Toyota. If you need to turn on captions, uh, please, kick, please click the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom window. And our sign language interpreter will be on the screen for the entire program. Instructions for how to pin the ASL interpreter uh, are in the chat. The focus of this final week of the month is action and advocacy. Yesterday, we learned insights from nonprofit and congressional leaders in the field of disability policy on the state of, of, on the state of disability rights policy. Today, we will hear from disability rights champions in Congress and in civil society. They will discuss strategies to cultivate new allies and reach across communities, movements, and sectors. Jewish tradition and text are clear. Pirkei Avot 2.5 teaches, do not separate yourself from the community. Yet far too often, people with disabilities are shut out from living as full members of our society and people in our community are suffering because of it. To address the disparities that people with disabilities continue to face, it will, it will require self-advocates and allies alike to call for action, inclusion, and accessibility. To get us started, I'd like to now turn it over to Aaron Kaufman, who is a Senior Manager of Legislative Affairs at the Jewish Federations of North America. 
Thank you, Lee. You are a tremendous disability advocate and the future for disability rights is bright because of young people like you. Good afternoon. As was said, my name is Aaron Kaufman and I am the Senior Manager of Legislative Affairs here at the Jewish Federations of North America. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you my friend, Alison Barkov. Alison is Principal Deputy uh, Administrator and is serving as Acting uh, Administrator and Assistant Secretary for Aging in the Administration for Community Living, a or ACL as it's commonly known, within the Department of Health and Human Services. ACL is a critical agency for people with disabilities and their families. Allison has had a distinguished career serving in numerous positions within the Obama administration and clerking for Justice Sonia Sotomayor, and as well as working in senior positions in the field of disability advocacy. Beyond her impressive credentials, Allison, like me, has a brother who has a disability, and he was a catalyst for her work in disability policy. I'm delighted that each of you will discover what I've known for the past five years, that Allison is a fierce advocate for the full inclusion of people with disabilities in all facets of life. Allison, I look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Erin, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. It's a privilege to be here on behalf of the US Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living and on behalf of the Biden-Harris Administration. As Erin mentioned, the mission of the Administration for Community Living, the goal of, su of supporting opportunities for community living and inclusion for all has been my own life mission. My journey into disability advocacy began more than 40 years ago, a time when my family, like almost all families at the time, was told the place for my brother, who was born with an intellectual disability, was separated from society and, and in an institution. At that time, there was no such thing as community services. This was decades before the Americans with Disabilities Act, and shockingly, the right to public education had only been given to students with disabilities three years before he was born. Starting with the first major event in Evan's life, his bris, when he was eight days old, my family decided to celebrate Evan's life and began the very hard work of paving a path to create a world where Evan could become a valued member of his community and have the very same opportunities that my siblings and I have been given. Over the last 40 years, I've been privileged to be part of the disability advocacy community, both personally and professionally, and I've worked to create a system of community services to help people with disabilities work, live, and participate fully in community life. I've been part of leading the passage and enforcement of civil rights laws, and most importantly, um, have been part of the important work of self-advocates and allies in changing the way society views people with disabilities. Um, when I was asked to speak for Jewish Disability Advocacy Month, I, I looked at my calendar and almost to this day a year ago, I was doing one of my favorite things in the entire world, sharing a stage with my brother Evan, who himself now is an accomplished self-advocate in his own right, talking about how far we've come in the disability rights movement and how far we still have to go. It's been an honor to return to the government um, on January 20th to help lead an agency that serves as the federal focal point for community living and inclusion. I want to spend a few minutes talking about some of the priorities of the Biden-Harris administration in the area of disability rights. The first place is COVID. ACL's mission has always been important, but with COVID-19, our work has literally become a matter of life and death. Our shared work, all of us today, has never been more urgent. And it's our responsibility to make sure that the needs of people with disabilities are considered in the federal pandemic response. ACL, of course, has been working nonstop since the pandemic began, highlighting issues facing people with disabilities. But the administration has put out a bold plan in its national COVID-19 strategy and its executive orders 
that recognize the many ways that people with disabilities have been impacted and in many ways to date left behind in a lot of COVID responses. Um, these include areas like vaccination, testing, protecting the caregiving workforce and equity. And ACL has raised our hand um, to be part of the work that the administration and particularly the Department of Health and Human Services will be doing to make sure that the response to COVID um, is equitable and it meets the needs of people with disabilities. We're working on everything from vaccine allocation and administration to making sure that the lives of people with disabilities and older adults who are in congregate settings are protected. Um, we've been working on making sure that people have access to life-saving treatment and are not discriminated against, and that the needs of the workforce, including families and volunteers who provide services, are considered when we're thinking about access to PPE and how to make sure supports are in place. It's important that we continue our work on transitioning people out of institutions and helping people who are in the community remain safe. And of course, as ACL, we, we work very hard to make sure that our disability and aging networks who have been called on to do so much during this time of pandemic are supported and are given the resources they need to support our community. The second priority of the Biden-Harris administration that I think has some important opportunities for the disability community is as part of economic recovery, President Biden has highlighted the need to address the caregiver infrastructure that we have in this country. And that includes both the formal long-term services and support system, as well as family caregivers. Um, this really is an unprecedented opportunity for us as a community to think bold, to think about the changes that need to be in place so people with disabilities can get the supports they need to fully participate in community life. And that so much that's been put on families um, and in many ways families have had to leave the workforce to, to take the caregiving responsibilities because of the lack of services in this country how we can think about strategies to address that. And then the final um, pillar of the Biden-Harris administration that I really want to highlight is around equity. We have had um, so much across this country happen, particularly over the last six months to, to really lay bare the systemic inequalities um, that face so many people in our country. While there is a centering of, of racial justice and systemic racism that we absolutely need to focus on, for many people in the disability community, they're multiply marginalized. And those intersections for people with disabilities who are also from communities of color, who are experiencing um, poverty, who have other um, identities that, that make them marginalized, we have an imperative that our work really think about how do we make sure that the most underserved, the most left behind are put front and center in our work. Um, almost every single meeting that I've participated in, whether it's from the White House or the leadership of the Department of Health and Human Services has really pushed us to think about um, disability issues and those intersectionalities in all that we do. Um, the last thing I just want to briefly touch on, and then I will turn it back over to Erin, is the commitments that I bring in to ACL. Um, in the months that I have been here, and I, it has been a very, very full 30 days, I can't say how impressed I've been with all of the ACL staff. This is an, a mission-driven organization, and literally every person that I've had a chance to interact with is deeply committed to the work that we're doing and the urgency that, that we face right now with the COVID pandemic. We have a lot to build off and just a few things I wanna highlight. ACL has always been excellent in engaging stakeholders. And one of our most important roles as an agency is representing the issues facing people with disabilities, both as um, the agency 
given that directive in HHS uh, to advise the secretary, but we play a role across the entire federal government. We can't effectively represent our community if we aren't engaging with people with disabilities themselves, with allies and others to hear about what the most important priorities and concerns are. And we're committed to, to, um, to doing that engagement all the time. We know that there can't be one solution in one agency to the work of disability inclusion. It involves everything from services to housing, to transportation, to education. And we are committed to working across the federal government and collaborating with other federal agencies to make sure that our policies align and move towards our shared goals of inclusion. And finally, the brilliance of ACL is that it brought together a lot of different programs, a lot of different voices. And our work is committed to moving forward the goals of community living across all types of disabilities and across the entire lifespan. Our voices are much stronger together when we advocate as a, as a group um, and, and push forward those common goals. I just wanna end by thanking you for having me, um, saying I, I really look forward to our collaboration together um, and I will pass it back to Aaron to open it up for a couple questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Allison. I think it's ev evident to everyone on this webinar that you are so passionate and so knowledgeable about disability issues. And we look forward to working with you. You mentioned that you and Evan have discussed many times how we uh, in the disability rights movement have a long way to go. We've made great progress over the past 30 years since the ADA was passed, but there's a long way to go. So along those lines, what do you think the number one misconception is about people with disabilities and what can ACL do to combat it? In, in my experience, I think the number one misperception that sometimes I hear is that community living and inclusion is for some people with disabilities. And what we know and what I've seen in my, my many years of working um, you know, in this field and, and in my own personal relationships is that with the right supports, when we really take a person-centered approach about what is it that people need, every single person with a disability can be included. Every single person with a disability can be a meaningful member of their community. And so that's a commitment that we have at ACO. All means all. And what we try to do at ACL, and, and I'm committed to, to continuing to do this in our work, is really lifting up those best practices, particularly for people who may have more significant support needs. Um, whether we're talking about what it looks like to um, you know, make decisions for yourself, what it looks like to be included in a classroom, what it looks like to hold a job, we have great models and we know it can be done and we really need to, with intentionality, share those success stories for people with a whole range of types of disabilities and level of support needs. Oh, I think you're on mute, Aaron. Yes, uh, thank you, that was really great. Um, my next question is, and I know you cannot give specific advice on what to advocate for, um, but my next question is, there are people on this webinar today that may wanna advocate for themselves as people with disabilities, or maybe there's someone with a son or daughter with uh, disabilities, but they don't know how to become an advocate. And you know how acutely impacted people with disabilities are by the decisions of policymakers. So generally speaking, um, what advice would you give to people who want to advocate uh, for themselves or others? And how can they be in touch with the Biden administration? Sure. So um, I, I will say as um, there's so much value in, um, in different kind of leadership and advocacy programs for self-advocates. Um, I know speaking for uh, my brother, he's, he has, he is now, as I mentioned, a, a real leader in his own right. Um, you know, he 
uh, is now a member of his state's Developmental Disabilities Council, but it doesn't start there. It, it starts with whether you connect through um, your, your synagogue, whether you connect through a state self-advocacy group, whether you connect through um, you know, a, a family support group. There's so many ways out there that peer-to-peer -peer relationship, finding a mentor, finding someone who can really help you understand how to share your story. I do a lot of trainings at Partners in Policymaking, which is a, um, before I joined ACL, I did. And the thing that I always share with people is you don't have to be a policy expert to be an advocate. What you can do is share your own story and your own story is what is most powerful. So the, the thing that I would say to people is really, if you have an experience, um, whether it's as a person with a disability, as a family member, as a provider, that experience and sharing that is a really, really effective um, form of advocacy. With respect to engaging with the, the Biden administration, um, you know, the, the administration is only on day like 31 or 32, and I think people are still, you know, entering into their positions. But what I can say across the board is there is a commitment to engaging with stakeholders and hearing from stakeholders. I, I can commit to that at ACL, but every other agency that I've been working with, they want to hear from stakeholders. They want to hear from the disability community. So I'd encourage you, um, work through Aaron, work through other national advocates who, who can direct you to the right people, but ask for meetings. Um, having the stakeholder voice informing federal policies is crucial and it's key. And um, the time is right right now to start having those conversations as priorities are being put in place. Thank you. And the last question I have for you um, is one that I'm actually really curious about because I've never asked you this question. This is your second tour of duty, so to speak, in government. So what drew you to government and public service, Allison? Um, you know, this actually is my third tour of duty in, in uh, public service. I, I may be the most come in and out. Um, I'm always looking for the place to make the biggest difference. And, and that um, that's every decision I've made in my career has been, what is the opportunity to, to make a big change? I'm so excited to join uh, the Biden-Harris administration when I saw the policies coming out, when I saw the priorities that the administration put out. And um, while COVID has been such an incredible tragedy, it has laid bare so many of the issues that I think we have been saying for so long, the need to um, strengthen opportunities for community inclusion, strengthen um, you know, our workforce, think about employment differently, think about self-determination. And I saw a commitment from the administration. I saw an opportunity, maybe unprecedented, to move forward some of the policies that I've spent my life trying to work on. Um, so I'm thrilled to be in a place where um, I think there is a great commitment to all of our shared goals around inclusion, and um, I, I really am looking forward to the opportunity to think together about how to move some of our, um, some of these goals together, um, and I hope that this will be maybe my most fruitful stint in the federal government. Let's hope so. And I just want to say that I'm sure everyone uh, listening to you today is feeling so grateful that you and this administration are so committed to improving the lives of people with disabilities. And Allison, my friend, I'm truly honored to call you a friend and colleague. And I know how busy your schedule is. So all of us here at JFNA and the RAC are grateful for your time and wish you the best of luck as we fight for a truly inclusive society. Thank you, Erin, and thank you again for having me. Thank you, Erin and Allison, for that enlightening and insightful and powerful conversation. Plenty to take away from that. Uh, my name is Yuri Jacoby. I am the legislative manager at the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you all today, although we wish we could be together in person. 
Um, but it is my honor to introduce the next segment of our session today, which features a number of members of Congress who are leaders on disability rights issues on Capitol Hill. First, we will hear from Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware, who will share some advocacy tips and reminders. Then we will turn it over to my friend and colleague, Barbara Weinstein, Director of the Commission on Social Action of Reform Judaism, who will moderate a panel featuring Congressman Pete Sessions of Texas and Congressman John Katko of New York. And finally, we will have a video from Senator Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire. And now, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester. Greetings. I'm Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware. Let me begin by thanking the Jewish Federations of North America and all of the 180 partner organizations for your tireless work for people with disabilities throughout Jewish Disability Advocacy Month and year round. I also wanna thank all of the disability rights advocates, human service providers, those with disabilities and all of our allies in this fight for justice and equality. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to join you for today's session on effective advocacy for inclusive policy. And we know this session couldn't be more timely. As our country has battled the ravages of COVID-19, the pandemic's toll on those with disabilities and the barriers that they faced has been even greater over the past year. Effective advocacy has been something that I've always been passionate about. Going back to my days decades ago as a caseworker in a congressional office working on social security disability, to my time as Delaware labor secretary and personnel director, and my most recent work at the Institute for Community Inclusion at UMass Boston. Like many of you, my journey through public advocacy has always been informed by a lens of love and an eye to creating a more inclusive and equitable world. It's about the people. I know you will gain a lot from this session on effective ways to advocate. And if you don't mind, I'd love to share with you five quick tips, just basic quick tips that I've learned along the way. The first thing that I've learned, you're already doing it. You're ensuring that your voices are heard. You're connecting with Congress. So before and while you meet with members, try to find common ground with that person. Um, they may have a personal connection. It could be a old job. It could be a project. It could be a family member. For me, it was all three and they can become your champion. Google's your friend, know the member. Two, get to know the staff. After all, uh, having been a staffer myself, they're pretty powerful. Truly though, they are knowledgeable about the issues. Um, they are able to focus where the member might be doing five different things. That staff member can be a great ally as well and help you navigate. Know the member, know the staff. Know your stuff. Now, I know you already do, but sometimes people come in and they haven't really done the research in the background, both on the bills or the policies that they really want to champion or what the member has, has championed before. So when you come in, know your stuff, have your facts, have your figures, know what you want to say. Four, know your ask. Why are you there? What do you hope to achieve? A lot of times people forget this really important part. They might get into a great conversation, then get outside of the door and say, oh, I forgot to ask for their support on that bill or that appropriation. Know your ask and make sure that you pay attention to your time. If you got 15 minutes, make sure you get it in that 15 minutes. Know your ask. And the final tip, after you know the member, know the staff, know your stuff and know your ask, no giving up. I love the saying that the race isn't given to the swift nor to the strong, but to the one that endures. We know that it took nearly two decades after Brown versus Board of Ed for IDEA to become law and that it took 
years of work and advocacy for the ADA to be signed into law. But know this, your work and your advocacy matters. It is that work that brings us every day closer to Dr. King's version of that beloved community, a community in which all people, all people of the earth can share its wealth, a community in which poverty, homelessness, and hunger will not be tolerated because our decency will not allow it, a community in which racism, and I add anti-Semitism, and all forms of bigotry, including discrimination against those with disabilities, will be replaced with an all-inclusive spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood. As I close, I just want to encourage you to keep up the good fight and know that you have allies standing by your side, ready and willing to build that beloved community with you. Thank you. Thank you. What an inspiring message, message from Congresswoman Blunt Rochester. We're so thrilled she was able to take the time to share that with us this afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you. I'm Barbara Weinstein. I'm the director of the Reform Movement's Commission on Social Action and the associate director at the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. And I am very pleased to introduce our first guest this afternoon, uh, Congressman Pete Sessions. We're gonna be joined in a few minutes as well by Congressman Mark Katko. Um, but first, let me introduce Congressman Sessions to all of you. Of course, he represents the 17th district in Texas. And through really throughout his career, he's been a true leader on uh, disability uh, inclusion efforts. Um, Congressman Sessions, uh, whose son Alex was born with Down syndrome, helped establish the first Congressional Down Syndrome Caucus. Um, he's been a leading supporter of the Family Opportunity Act, the Disability Integration Act, the Able Age Adjustment Act, and the ALS Disability Insurance Access Act. So really could not think of um, someone uh, more immersed in this work to join us this afternoon. And, and Congressman, I know it's been a tough couple of weeks for uh, Texans across the state. So we're really keeping your community and your constituents in our prayers as, as everyone recovers. Um, can you hear me okay, Congressman? Okay, we'll give him a second. I saw Congressman Sessions a moment ago. I'm gonna have to say all those nice things over and over, make sure he knows how appreciative we are of being with us. There you are. Congressman, can you hear me okay? Okay, can't hear you. No, not quite yet. Try again. Any better? Oh, yes, there we go. There we go. Sorry, Dave. Dave uh, yes, our interpreter <laughs> was awesome. Uh, I want to start by showing a picture of my baby, who's now 26 years old, Alexander Gregory Sessions. And the story I want to tell is one that I think also has merits to it and is uplifting. Uh, this is Alex as a, as a Boy Scout. He's an Eagle Scout, both he and his brother. So I'll, I'll kind of go to the end of the story and work back. I'm the father of two sons, one in the top 2% academically in the country, who's now a medical doctor uh, and who lives in South Carolina and is on the front line of the COVID battle uh, in Greenville, South Carolina. And the second, an equally talented and awesome little brother, Alexander, who happens to be academically in the other end of the scale. Alex uh, is a plenty capable young man. He just has some limitations. And those limitations are not anything that hold him back but that obviously give challenges to him 
in his daily life. He was perfect the way God created him, and we accept him that way. But I want to go back to a year of 1997. 1997, uh, I opened up all the mail myself, and I received a letter from a family who had a young man, a Down syndrome man, whose name was Dylan C. James. And the mom and the dad had two other children. And Dylan, as a Down syndrome young man, had been through 13 surgeries at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And these surgeries uh, culminated in, in the family on a glide path where they thought they were making real progress. And then lo and behold, the dad took uh, a bonus of $700 and fell out of the ability to be on Medicaid for Dylan. His mom had previously quit work, they were struggling. And they wrote me a letter and said, what are we gonna do, help? So I went and met with them and we struggled. And then one day at a Down syndrome event, I met a woman whose name was Connie, who worked with Senator Kennedy. And she said, why don't we work together on your ideas? And I said, that'd be great. And then there was a guy named Grassley, Senator Grassley, a guy from uh, Iowa. And then there was a guy named Harkin, who was from Iowa, who attended these Down syndrome events also. And we worked and we put together based upon the facts of the case. And it's important that I hope everybody hear a couple of things I say today. The circumstances were that a family that had problems like this family, the James family, many times, times they were encouraged to give their child up to the state to have a foster parent take care of them. It would cost and there were some 5,000 across the country a year. And it would cost the state about $50,000 to get someone to take care of the child. And lo and behold, they would be responsible as the advocate for the child to take the child and put them in Medicaid. So we cut through this and said, why don't we just let the parents take the child and put the child in Medicaid? Why would we want to give up our own, their own children to someone else? Why not help that child? Now, some would say help the family. Well, I think it really does. But what happened is, is that we came up with a bill that allowed a family that was up to four times the poverty level in 2005, that was about $88,000. I don't know what it is today, but four times the poverty level. So that if a family has a child, the child qualifies and it's on a sliding scale basis, which means based upon what the family is, it may cost them $10 to a couple hundred. Well, this was a great bill, Family Opportunity Act, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, through a young man named President Clinton, through George W. Bush, and then in 2005, Alexander Sessions came with me and his mom and his brother, and we went to the White House. And we went to the White House and George W. Bush as president had known Alex years before he was born. Alex's grandfather, Judge William Sessions, was, had served as the director of the FBI. And we were going to my dad's uh, portrait hanging so we went by to see President Bush and he was most generous and nice with his time. And I'm sorry, I don't have the pictures in front of me. I just been rushed with our other stuff we've got going on with the, with the, uh, with the uh, problem with the weather. 
But what happened is, is that Alex was greeted very nicely by President Bush. And President Bush said, Alex, how are you? And Alex said, thank you for helping my dad and other people with dad's bill. President Bush looked up and said, Congressman Sessions, what is he talking about? I said, Mr. President, there's a very nice bill that we have been stalled in. We need your help. And Alex looked back at the president and said, can you help us? President Bush went out of his way and called Speaker Dennis Hastert at some point days later and said, the next time a must pass piece of legislation comes here, I want the Family Opportunity Act on my desk. This came from the source of a Down syndrome young man. The president in a direct conversation from the most powerful person in the world, from a man who was an Eagle Scout, a fine young man who advocated for so many. I think and, that really speaks to the power of, of self-advocacy, which is something that we speak a lot about at, at Jewish Disability Advocacy Month, for sure. But it takes, it takes somebody to listen. And yep. so what I would say to you, and I'll finish here now, my point is, let's look for things that cut through and don't just go and spend more money, but let's find things like this to where we were spending the money on five or three different sources rather than keeping it where it was most effective with the family, with the child, with his parents who love their babies and then get it done. And so I want you to know that no one really knows about this, even though it was a fight for eight years. Family Opportunity Act is the law of the land. And it, well, it is meaningful and it makes a difference. I want to thank each of you for being on this call today. Aaron, Ben, Pepe, Henrietta, uh, Cookie, Camden, Corey. We have, we have that's more than 60 folks on the call, Congressman. Well, that's all I can say. Yeah, okay. thank, I'm you. Sure. thank you very much. And and thank you. I mean, the leadership you've shown on, on that issue and so many others of importance to us has just been really essential. And I'm curious, a lot of the colleagues that you mentioned who were partners to you in this early on, even uh, Senator Kennedy, Senator Harkin, um, like you have family members and have been you know, directly uh, impacted um, or seeing uh, what the challenges and opportunities are for people with disabilities. So I'm curious, when you're talking to your colleagues who might not have that direct experience, what are the most effective arguments you make to them when you're trying to bring them into this work? Well, I think the most effective arguments are that we have an obligation uh, to, I think, treat people not just fairly and with compassion, but we need to really lead ourselves where we give accommodation, where we don't have to take it out on anybody, but we have to include them. And it's called inclusiveness or accommodation. Uh, Barbara, you don't know this. I'm probably the one member of Congress most closely associated with retina diseases. And I have spent an enormous amount of time with Tony Fauci, with Dr. Collins and with the with, at the National Eye Institute, which is uh, other people now, and blindness and issues of retina is one of my most important activities right now, and so I'm I'm very involved in these. Deeply believe, uh, just as this this great religion, the Jewish religion, has a focus on this, so should a number of people because it's key in the Bible how uh, cures are possible and how us working for these things. So thank you for allowing me to be here. But next time when you are able to talk about uh, retina issues, I'd love to give you updates on exciting things that we think are, as always, have been around the corner this right to try, 
that we did uh, where we gave NIH uh, really a lot of money and moved them out of uh, from discretionary to mandatory. All these things have been done for a reason. And I do believe that what we're going to do is turn the corner for people who are in these special categories. And it mostly is from love of caring. Thanks, and, and that's really helpful. I'm, I'm curious also knowing the particular impact that COVID has had this year for people with disabilities and their those who support them. What are some other steps that you think the federal government can be doing at this moment particularly um, to help our community? You know, that's a good question. I wanna start by saying this. Last week, there was a hearing in the Science Committee. Congresswoman, Chairwoman, Eddie Bernice Johnson had a blue ribbon panel on and one of the women who was on qualified herself and said, I received no support or have anything to do with anybody that was involved in this trial. I came as a medical expert and she said, I can without any question say that what was done was done in the best interest of not just science, but was done at the highest advocacy. And what she did when she did that is say that she believed that every kind of person that's out there, whether they have a disability, I specifically mentioned Down syndrome, she believed that while there have not been studies on to finally conclude, she said she has no reason to assume that a person who might be at risk of getting it would be better with the shot. And she put that across the board. Now, I'm not a medical doctor, but that's what she said. So I want you to know they're very high off the vaccination and feel like that even if you get just one shot of, of a two shot series, that it makes a difference. The things that I have noticed most about this are the same things that impact what might be you and myself or children, isolation. Uh, my son, even though he gets up and goes to work a couple days a week, it still is an isolation. He has a mask on, he's used to, he's a gregarious young man. So we're all suffering in one way or another. And I think it's really important to know that we can turn the corner that this does make a difference, that we're on the right path, uh, but that we need to pay attention to people who might be isolated. Seniors, those with uh, an intellectual disability that may not be able to work through these things as easily, uh, and, and we can turn this around. So it's special attention. That's, that's really helpful, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I hope I did well enough to get invited back. And I hope we get to do this in person next year. That would be delightful. Um, and uh, and I'm curious, just before we close, Congressman, you know, your, your son is clearly an inspiration, an example to you as well. Um, what advice would you offer to some of our younger participants who are watching, um, who want to also become more involved in self advocacy, in uh, public policy, and uh, and advocacy? Well, two, two avenues, and thank you, Barbara, for stating it that way, because one of them is something that is the Shrivers are deeply engaged in. I was on the phone the other day. Uh, I had gotten to know Anthony some years ago. Uh, Best Buddies is an advocacy group that's a high school and college uh, club oriented. What a great way to spend your time, to mentor, to give time to and address these issues. Uh, Special Olympics, I've been involved in for all these years. Uh, showing up, uh, the, the spirit of the games uh, is fair and, it, and it's good. But if you wanna get involved in policy, I would say I would start with find ways that we can cut through uh, and find a better way. Don't just go spend money, don't just go say you want to create something, make it valuable, make it where it shows, you know, has value. And that's what I tried to do with Family Opportunity Act is cut through to where you make a difference. 
Uh, money is important. I, I don't doubt any of that. But access, inclusion, and accommodation uh, beat uh, more government spending. Making, giving opportunity to people to be, quote, just like, uh, I got to be careful, but just like what you and I might be able to get up and move, able to walk freely, able to go do these things. Include people in that. Include them in your church or your synagogue. Include them in a lunch. And I found as a parent, probably the most difficult times for a parent uh, are not people coming up and bothering you or making things difficult because you have to hang around bathrooms where your child is in there and they look at you like, what are you doing in the bathroom? And, you know, you get over that. But if people would come and just take a, a baby or take a child, give some respite and, and pay attention, just come to somebody's house once a month and go watch TV, TV with them. These are things that are person to person that I think is the best time spent, even if it's not policy expert. That's we can wonderful. all make a difference. Thank you, Congressman. That's really, really helpful. And yes, I know we've been joined as well by Congressman John Katko. Thank you, Congressman, for being with us. Thank um, thanks, Abby. I, I just popped out of another meeting, but I wanted to make sure I said hello to everybody. And um, Val, if you have any questions or anything right now. No, really appreciate you making the time. Maybe we have time just for one question. And I, I know how important um, IDEA has been to you and ensuring full funding for it. Um, so I'm curious, maybe you could speak a little bit, just what do you think it's going to take to ensure that all children with disabilities are able to obtain an appropriate education? Well, I can tell you um, uh, from firsthand experience, uh, the special ed teaching is very, very difficult to get um, the help that they need. And, and the, sc the school systems are completely overwhelmed. I adopted two foster kids and they're doing okay now, but you know, growing up, they had a lot of uh, uh, learning, learning disabilities that we had to deal with. And it was a constant struggle just to try and get any uh, modicum of assistance for them. And, and the, the school systems were, were strapped. I mean, there's nothing worse to me than an unfunded mandate from the federal government. And that's exactly what we have with, 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 uh, with uh, the idea uh, with uh, this special ed funding. And, and to me, we've got to do what we can to, to uh, if we're going to mandate something on the federal level, we, we damn well better figure out a way to pay for it. Because what's happening is they're putting these mandates on the states and the states are, are, are foisting it off on the school districts. And then the school districts are, are getting crushed with budgets that they can't possibly handle. So uh, what, what uh, goes by the wayside uh, whenever possible is uh, uh, you know, uh, funding, for the, funding for these programs. And to me, um, the IEPs are individualized education plans. Um, they're not just a concept. You know? uh, they're, they're something that's required. And I look at it this way. You either pay it now when they're growing up, or you can have a lifetime of individuals that are gonna be less productive uh, because you're not helping them in the front end. And that's, to me, it's just foolish. So um, I think we should provide the funding for it, for, plain and simple. And uh, I, 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 uh, uh, what states are doing, especially New York State, they're destroying local school districts' uh, budgets by, uh, by having the unfunded mandates passed down to them. So uh, anything we can do to provide the funding, I'm all for, and uh, I've, uh, I've advocated for that quite a bit. Um, uh, so, uh, I think also there's the stigmatization. I don't know if you talk about this at all. I mean, we've got to we've got to continue to strive to break through that with with, uh, with IEPs and with uh, individuals with disabilities. Um, and I'll tell you one quick story, then I'll shut up. Um, an individual when I was first campaigning years ago, um, I was at a baseball game throwing t-shirts into the stands, and uh, I was trying to get her one. And uh, she obviously had Down syndrome, and uh, I couldn't get it to her, so I walked up and gave it to her. About four months later, I saw her again and uh, on the campaign trail, just ran into her by happenstance. And she said to me, she goes, call me when you get a chance. And she gives me her card. And she said, Kayla McEwen, individual, or she goes, Kayla McEwen, motivational speaker, All right? So fast forward, I get elected. I, she became an intern in my office. And then I brought her down to DC and to make a long story short for an event, uh, she became the first person in the history of our government 
who uh, became a registered lobbyist with, it, uh, with Down syndrome. And she still is to this day. So um, to, to say that, you know, uh, there, there isn't success stories or absolutely are success stories. And we got to strive for those every single day. And it starts with the nitty gritty of funding these programs the way they should be funded. Because like I said, everybody outset, you either pay me now or you're going to have, you know, you're going to pay later with less productivity for people because they didn't get the education they should have when they were kids. And that's just, that's just not America. Well, I think, you know, that's one of the main reasons we have Jewish Disability Advocacy Month and Advocacy Day. And um, really just our, our, our main goal here is to connect with as many members of Congress to share our stories and experiences and to work with others like you who are committed to really, um, really providing the opportunities that uh, everyone deserves. So really thank you for everything you have done and are doing. And we look forward to lots of opportunities to work together. Uh, I, I'll be happy to do that. Now, one quick shameless plug, and then I'll shut up. Uh, sure. I did I did something last year. I sponsored marriage marriage uh, with Disabilities Act, I believe it's called. Let me see the exact title: Marriage Access to People's with uh, Special Ability Act. Um, if you have if you're on disability uh, because of uh, uh, you have a disability, whatever, um, and you get married, uh, you you get a reduction in the disability you both can receive, which is ridiculous. And so we're trying to fix that too. So it comes with programs like that as well. So it's, you know, the funding's got to be there and you can't be penalizing people uh, when being productive members of society. It just can't do it. Um, and that's one of the reasons we've also made the uh, Able Age Adjustment Act our, one of our primary focuses for the year. So it's right all work in tandem for sure. Um, I really want to thank you, Congressman Katko and, and Congressman Sessions as well for being with us this afternoon. Um, just we really appreciate your time and, uh, and all the dedication you've placed on these issues. Um, and I'm now very pleased to turn to a message from Senator Maggie Hassan of New Hampshire. Hello, I'm Senator Maggie Hassan from New Hampshire. Thank you to everyone joining today for participating in this year's Jewish Disability Advocacy Month. And thank you for your hard work. All of you recognize that fully including all people, regardless of their personal circumstances, is critical to the strength of our people and our society. As the mother of a son who experiences severe disabilities, my family has seen firsthand the power and impact that advocacy can have. Because of all of those who had fought to include people like my son, Ben, he had the opportunity to go to school, to learn, and make friends in our New Hampshire community. Ben's experience, and knowing that it was the work of advocates, educators, and champions for people like Ben who helped make this experience possible, inspired me to get involved in public service, and it has informed my work since. In Congress, I'm continuing to work with members of both parties to build on the progress that our country has made, and we must ensure that individuals who experience disabilities receive the support that they need at home, in school, and at work, especially as our country navigates the COVID-19 pandemic. As we continue this work, I'm proud to have partners like all of you. Your efforts are helping to build on our nation's promise of equality. And I know that we will keep working together to ensure that individuals who experience disabilities are fully included in every aspect of our society. Thank you to the Jewish Federations of North America and all of your partners for your continued advocacy. And it's my pleasure to now turn it over to the CEO of the Jewish Federations of North America, Congressman Eric Fingerhut. Thank you and keep up the great work. Thank you, Senator Hassan, for joining us today, for your leadership and your advocacy. And thanks to all those who participate in today's program, our guests from the Biden administration and from the halls of Congress. Thanks to all those who have participated in this entire month of extraordinary programming, over 180 partners, 2,500 participants uh, who participated in over 50 different sessions. Say a special word of thank you to the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism with whom we've worked so closely for so many years on this program and to all of our partners. Thank you to all those who provided us, told us their stories of self-advocates, leading professionals and policymakers in the, from the US, Canada and Israel. 
all of these are people who are living their values to ensure that we build an inclusive and just society. So there's a famous debate in the Talmud, uh, which has shaped so much of our Jewish experience. Two of our great rabbis, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Tarfon, debate the question, which is more important, study or action? Rabbi Tarfon says it's action, of course, but Rabbi Akiva teaches, and his position prevails, that it's study because study leads to action. That's what we've been doing during this Jewish Disability Month. We have been studying, we've been learning from some of the best teachers and studying the issues in depth. But for this to matter, study must lead to action. And so I'm proud to wrap up this Jewish Disability Advocacy Month program with our call to action. Tomorrow is the National Day of Action. Please complete the action alert to urge your elected officials to support people with disabilities, their families and caregivers in the next COVID relief package. And please also help us advocate uh, for the ABLE Age Adjustment Act expanding the account eligibility by 8 million people with disabilities diagnosed later in life to help them bear the high costs of their disability related expenses. These issues, COVID relief and the ABLE Age Adjustment Act, in addition to all of the other important uh, uh, issues that you can teach our uh, legislators about regarding disability will bring the action that we seek and that have brought us together to study and to learn during this Jewish Disability Advocacy Month. Thank you all for all you have done to date. Please join in tomorrow's national call for action and we will see you all again at the next Disability Advocacy Program. Mm -hmm.